some of you might be getting little tweaks here and there and you don't know what they are or how to, how to deal with them. So we will uh, address all those things tonight. Um, but before that, I also want to thank you for your fundraising. Hope you're all doing well for fundraising. With the miles you're running, you should be posting that and just blasting that to all your friends about how wonderful you're doing on your journey. And to remind you of why you're fundraising, we have for tonight one of our Young Runner Ambassadors. Um, is he available? Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking at the hall. Come on over here. This is Anna Fun. He's been in our program for a while, and he is going to tell you what running means to him. Hi, everyone. Hi, Team for Kids. How's everyone doing today? Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. I mean, that's the New York spirit, right? Yeah. Well, my name is Anupam Kumar, and I'm, a new, as, she, as she mentioned, a New York World Runner, Young Runners Ambassador. Pretty long name, pretty long title for a job. Um, and today, I'm going to share with you my experience of running, and as well as my experience in the Young Runners program, which is a program which is motivated by your support and your running. So let's start with my childhood. <laughs> That's where running starts, right? Um, so when I was a child, I loved to run. But then came along PlayStation and Xbox and computer games. And because of that, I stopped exercising. I stopped running, and there we have it. I gained a lot of weight, and soon I also realized that my school days weren't going so well either. My grades started sloping down the hill, and Things really went bad. I, I, even ga I even became depressed over time. There was a lot of problems that I encountered. And all this within one year of that computer game thing that began to happen to me. And this is a time, this is a moment when my gym teacher in Ethiopia, observing me, said, I think you should start running again. I took her advice and I must tell you, that was the most amazing day for my life. I started running again, and I, I again started feeling that same energy, the same positivism that I used to have. And since then, I've been continuing running. That was back in Ethiopia, and then later, when I came to New York City, I was first introduced to the New York Roadrunners program through my uh, cross-country teacher, Miss Holly Younglow, who will be running the marathon this year, I heard. I can't wait for that. And, um, I signed up to run in the Young Runners program event. And I must tell you that although I used to be running, before I trip on this, um, <laughs> although I used to be running, the Young Runners program motivated me to run even more. In fact, I came running here. In the, <laughs> yeah, I was being a true New York world runner. <laughs> and soon I, I learned about all the wonderful opportunities that Young Runners provides including meeting a lot, of you, a lot of you guys. Team for Kids, who, who motivates this program to move forward. Team for Kids, which is made up of so many people from so many backgrounds, all motivated to run and help running to move forward. <sighs> you know, although it's typed on this paper, which I'm reading and cheating off of to speak to you, <coughs> I must tell you that even on, in, on any scale, I, I personally cannot put into words how important the team for kids is and how important the Young Runners is to me. It not only helps ath young athletes like myself bring our, our talent out to the world, but also helps a healthy environment be created in New York City. It motivates us all to keep moving, and because of this program, I have met new runners. I have met new people and being immensely inspired to keep running, keep moving, and keep exercising. The power of young runners, ladies and gentlemen, is one, as I said, cannot be put into words. So let us all work together, keep running, and keep this city moving. Keep the most active city in the world continue to be active. We will run today so that every child born tomorrow, every New Yorker of tomorrow, can be healthy and prosperous. This is our means of being healthy, happy, and active. And as I close my speech, as I close my words to you, I'd just like to remind you, the true change in my life came from running. That was the real game of life. 
Thank you.
Um, you can stay under that level, then you stay out of injury trouble. It's when we exceed that level, bam, that's where we get into trouble. That is where injuries start to occur. The hard part is figuring out what that level is, and that's part of the art of, of running. Um, genetics definitely has a, a high tendency. If you are one of these elite marathon runners coming from uh, different countries, you may have gen genetically a better ability to run. Um, not everybody has the same ability, basically. <laughs> um, age, inactivity, illness, these are all things that are going to decrease that. So a 98-year-old is not going to be able to do the same thing that an 82-year-old, that a 72-year-old, that a 22-year-old is going to do. So age is, is a factor as well. Now, the important thing is that active training near that threshold will increase the threshold level. So if we train at two miles a week for the rest of our life, we're going to be able to run two miles a week for the rest of our life. Now, if you train at 20 miles a week, and then followed by 21 miles, followed by 22 miles, that's the art of training, because this threshold will slowly go up, as long as you're training close to that level of, of, uh, of the threshold. And this is the principle by which all training follows, and the principle by which running injuries is important. So the other thing to remember is that that threshold decreases following an injury. So maybe you're running 30 miles a week, everything's going fine, you go up to 32 miles, and that just exceeds your level of uh, threshold. Then all of a sudden, bam, now your threshold has dropped down, which means if you take a week or two off, recover from your injury, and then go back to 30 miles a week, that's gonna get you into trouble again. So that's the, the other thing that you have to remember is that returning to running, you gotta be careful about how you go about it. Um, the main priority for, for uh, training is decreasing the, is basically increasing the activity level that will still allow for healing. So if you're basically taking time off from injury, you have to slowly ramp it back up again, almost as if you're starting from scratch sometimes. Obviously, every injury is going to be different. So how do we recover from injuries? Basically, rest. That means feet up on, off, the, off the ground. That means we're definitely below that threshold level. Um, but that's troublesome to maintain for a training schedule or for a specific race. If it's a month before the marathon, resting isn't such a great option. Two months before, it's a really tough option. So there are other things we can do besides pure rest. That includes cross-training, cycling, swimming, elliptical machines are all pretty good um, cross-training activities and not nearly as stressful as running on joints, but in general, can give us that conditioning to maintain uh, as we go. The thing to remember is that runners like to run, and it's really difficult to tell runners not to run because we all want to run. I don't want to stop running any more than you guys do in the middle of the training. We're all coming out there looking for a goal, trying to achieve something, whether it's a marathon, whether it's a certain level of fitness, it's part of what we do. And, and certainly, there's lots of people running in all kinds of crazy conditions um, that, uh, that most people would never think about. So injury prevention we'll talk about briefly. Basically, most of these principles have already been talked about, I'm sure, in all the different sessions you've got had. But I'll give you sort of my perspective. Obviously, overtraining, increasing distance, <coughs> frequency, all that stuff needs to be done at a level below that threshold for each individual in order to stay out of injury, so don't overtrain, and that's obviously something that the rest of the uh, training sessions all have been careful at watching for everybody. Um, the 10% rule gets thrown around, I put it up here just because it is something you hear a lot. It kind of makes sense for certain levels, it doesn't make much sense if you're running 10 miles a week, that means you're gonna be running 10.1 miles, next week 10.2 miles, or 10.12 miles, so um, it makes sense at the higher levels. If you're running 20 miles a week, adding on another two miles is probably reasonable. Running 30 miles a week, adding on three miles probably makes sense. So it's kind of a baseline level that people talk about. I don't find it that helpful, but I put it out there just because you'll hear it around. Um, other things you can do to prevent injuries. Build up leg strength. Um, you know, running is a very quadriceps and hamstring and calf muscle intensive sport. When you run, that's what's propelling you forward. Um, your hamstring, I mean your, your quadriceps muscles really don't receive that much stress until you do a lot of hill descents or other activities, but in general it's more focused on everything from here on back. Um, building up leg strength, particularly quadriceps strength, can be very important for keeping your knees healthy and can be very important for keeping your legs healthy as you go. It's crazy to think that if we're running 40, 50 miles a week that we need to build up strength at the gym, but that's actually what can be very helpful. And if you look at professional marathon runners, they're running 120 miles a week, but they're still spending about four days, um, at least four one-hour sessions at the gym working with a trainer, aggressively strengthening quads. So definitely a good part of things. Core strength, really important. Um, myself, everybody I know has done it at one point in time, run, 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 and that's it. And the problem is building up core strength, improving your abs, improving your lower back muscles, hip muscles, is really important for stabilizing your core when you run. It means that the muscles around you don't have to work as hard. So it's less stress on your knees, less stress on the muscles down below. So 
Um, definitely good to incorporate some core strength. It's hard to do, but it's something that's important. So look up core strengthening. At home, you can do this stuff in a half an hour just by sitting around, around the house doing all kinds of exercises like she's doing. Um, stretching, definitely very important before and after runs. Um, the most important stretches that I think are the calves and hamstrings. Um, uh, a therapist coming here can probably give you more information about specific ones, but those are the ones that typically are gonna bear focusing on. There's obviously dozens of different stretches that people do, um, ones that are dynamic, ones that are static, but, uh, but in general you wanna maintain some stretching both before and after runs. Um, barrier terrain, I'm sure, I, I know you, I see you guys out on the, on the trails all the time on Central Park. Um, mixing uh, a mix of both hard and soft surfaces is very protective. Um, the softness is important, but in general it's the, the irregularity of it that I find to be very helpful. The problem is running is a very repetitive motion, and if you're running straight in a line on the hard pavement, then basically what you're doing is using the same muscles every single step. Running on dirt paths means you're using different muscles, you're dodging trees, potholes, whatever it is. Um, definitely varies those forces, so it just kind of changes that amplification principle. Treadmills <laughs> really are, can be trouble. I mean, I have patients who come in all the time who run 20 miles on a treadmill, and I can't believe that anybody can do that, but I see it once <laughs> or twice a year. And they come with all kinds of crazy tendonitis, and the first, the first thing they say is, well, everybody told me treadmills are safer, so that's what I did all my training on. The truth is, the treadmills really, every single step is exactly the same. You can't do anything different on a treadmill without falling off. So in general, <laughs> using treadmills for a huge portion of your training every week is probably not such a smart move. It's fine to mix some in, there's no harm in it, but you don't want to use it for everything for long distance stuff. Um, keeping rest days a part of any schedule is very important. Um, in the beginning, you want to try to do sort of you know, every other day running to give your legs a chance to, to, uh, to, to, um, to recover. But running seven days a week, even if it's just you know short distances seven days a week, still doesn't really give your body the chance to recover that it usually needs. So that's important to do at least one or two day rest days, um, even at the peak of training. Um, Well-fitted, updated, appropriate shoes. I have patients all the time coming in who bought shoes at Foot Locker. They were just basically, not the one on Union Square, but, the, uh, but just at a general store. Um, they showed me the shoes and they're basically like cross trainers that you would maybe use to work out at a gym. And it's definitely not something you want to run with. You need to go to a good running store, have somebody really look at your feet, and show you what good shoes are that are appropriate for the level of training, for the distances you're doing, um, and that's important. I'm not gonna go into brand names and things because there's a million of them out there, but in general, it's important. Um, hydrate, well, hydrate well during runs. Um, obviously, it's important not to get dehydrated because you can get sick, <coughs> and kidney problems and all that, but in general, keeping your muscles well hydrated also can make a difference too. Um, definitely, you see higher rates of overuse injuries with uh, sprained muscles, pulled muscles, things like that that happen when you're really at the peak of dehydration. So on a 20-mile training run, it's important to stay hydrated, not to get sick, but also to keep your muscles happy. Uh, good nutrition, really important as you start putting on the miles. Lots of calcium, lots of vitamin D. Calories, you want to have appropriate calories. You want to make sure that you're getting enough intake. If your mileage is dramatically increasing, your calories should be increasing too. Some weight loss is okay. You know, basically, it's, not, it's normal to lose some weight in the course of a training program, depending on how much weight you have, depending on how much weight you have to give up. You, it's okay to lose some weight, but you want to keep it under control and you want to keep it well monitored. So watching it with a scale is a pretty good thing to do um, as you go along. So uh, like I said, I'll talk about some basic, uh, some specific injuries, and then we'll talk a little bit more to kind of finish up. So stress fractures are the one thing that everybody hears about. Um, for running injuries, uh, almost everybody knows somebody who's had a stress fracture if you're a runner. Um, the important principle is to understand how these things happen. So like I said, running and even walking around the city streets breaks down bone. Bone is constantly being rebuilt and destroyed. Um, when astronauts go into outer space, guess what they do on the space station? They run. They get on these running treadmills that have got these crazy bands and things. They don't do that because they think it looks cool and they don't do it because they like to work out and they like to run in the snow at home. They do it because it helps them maintain bone mass. And astronauts that spend months on end at a space station, when they come home, are gonna lose some bone mass. This helps them prevent some of that. Gravity is a good thing and it's something that builds bone mass. So that constantly destroyed and rebuilt thing is a good thing to a point. The problem comes is when the formation follows behind destruction. So if we're destroying bone faster than we're forming it, bam, that's where we get into trouble. And that's something that we have to sort of keep an eye on. So if bone doesn't heal fast enough, it'll eventually break. The analogy I always use is a paperclip. It's very hard to break a paperclip, just like it's hard to break a tibia bone or a fibula bone or anything else. But if you bend the paperclip back and forth, back and forth, eventually you're gonna break it. We're basically bending our bones back and 
forth, the difference between us and the paperclip is we can heal our bones. So the paperclip won't heal and will break, but we hopefully will not. So who gets it or at risk for this? Women um, uh, typically are gonna have more risk for it. They typically have um, more levels of osteoporosis. Um, anybody who has some osteoporosis as a baseline is gonna be more of a, uh, is gonna be more of a risk. And certainly poor nutrition, not just eating disorders, but people who really drop their weight down to a level that may be um, you know, on the, uh, the lower scale of where they should be in terms of their, uh, their height and, uh, and age. So where do we see stress fractures? Well, basically anywhere in the lower extremities, everywhere from the pelvis uh, to the hip bone, to the knee bone, to ankles and foot. I mean, anywhere along the chain can happen. Um, the uh, more common sites are gonna be <coughs> up in the tibia or sometimes the fibula. So basically this is a cut on an MRI scan right across here. MRIs, by the way, are the best way to diagnose these things. Um, in the foot, you can see metatarsals, which is the bone in the foot here that lights up like a Christmas tree there. <laughs> the hip, we'll talk a little bit about hip because it's really important. The hip is a really high stress area. You can see the bone kind of makes kind of a curve right here. That curve a portion of it um, is very biomechanically favorable, but it does concentrate the stresses right where that white thing is right there. The white thing is an area of bone that is in the process of breaking. The problem is with so much stress right there, the white part can eventually go all the way across, and then what happens is the bone will crack into two pieces. It's a little hard to project here, but basically this bone is cracked all the way through. Um, and that's a catastrophic problem. Basically, when this happens, it's big time trouble. The biggest problem with it is not only is it can be catastrophic because it has to be fixed surgically. This is a runner that needs to be fixed with a plate and screws, but also what ends up happening is that the bone has a risk of, of basically falling apart, the blood supply can crack. So a young 22 year old runner who runs, 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 has lots of hip pain and ignores it, crack the bone breaks, next thing you know she's gonna be treated with one of these, and five years down the road can end up with a hip that collapses and dies and needs a hip replacement at age 25. So that's a catastrophic problem. It happens very rarely, but it's something that we all wanna watch out for. Um, because it's the one problem with running that is not something that's going to be healed up fairly easily. <coughs> Um, most stress fractures, anywhere in the body, hip, leg, foot, whatever it is, are gonna heal with simple rest. The risk of completion to full fracture is pretty low, except for the hip. Um, and in general, it takes anywhere from six weeks for the most benign fracture to three months um, for the more significant ones. <coughs> so, overuse injuries. Again, we talked about the fact that these are gonna happen pretty much anywhere in the lower chain, but these are you know, sort of the more common ones that we're gonna see. Um, everyone's probably heard about runner's knee if they've watched, you know, looked at Runner's World magazine or seen any, even the Roadrunner's Club um, uh, periodicals oftentimes will talk about it. Basically, it's a maltracking of the patella or the kneecap. It's increased pressure in one area on the outside here. Um, and it's, a, it's sort of a common injury that we see with pain that comes up in the front of the knee. It's sort of an aching or soreness. Usually going downstairs or down hills will do it. If you sit with a knee bent for a couple hours in a movie theater, it usually hurts. Or if you get up out of a chair for after sitting for a while, it can be painful. Um, pretty common problem, and certainly something that can, again, be one of these minor abnormalities in alignment that gets amplified by the distances that we do. IT band syndrome, the other common knee problem, sometimes combined with patellofemoral pain, is one of the common things that we see. This one's pain on the outside of the knee, and oftentimes it's point tenderness right on the outside there. Um, what this is is really um, more of a tightness problem where the IT band muscle starts to just rub, rub, rub right across that spot creates inflammation, that creates tightness, and tightness creates more pressure, more pressure creates pain, and you just get stuck in kind of a continuous cycle. Um, again, similar sort of problem, but uh, different area, more on the outside part of the knee. So to move on down, everyone always wants to know, does running cause arthritis, or most people have some preconceived notion about how terrible it is. My mom included will tell me how bad I'm destroying my knees by running more and more marathons. You think 12 marathons later, she'd stop telling me, but she's still going. <laughs> um, there is no association between running and premature arthritis. There have been lots of studies to look at runners to see who develops arthritis and who doesn't. And there's not been an increase in running and arthritis seen in a running population in any study anywhere. There have been studies that looked at MRIs, so they took runners, they put them in an MRI scanner right before a marathon, they got right off the marathon uh, path and went straight to the MRI scanner, got marathoned again. You know, we got MRI again, and then you got marathon again. We would show some more changes down here. Uh, another 26. Um, and they show no changes. So, you know, an MRI, which is a crazy sensitive test, picks up all kinds of little minor stuff. Um, it showed no difference between the scans, and this was a significant amount of runners. Now, the reason why it gets confusing 
is that there is a population of patients that shouldn't run. Those are patients who have arthritis already or develop arthritis in the process of running. The problem with running is it's a lot of stress across the knee joints, unlike biking, unlike swimming, unlike elliptical machines, which tend to be less stressful. So if you had to pick one exercise for somebody to do to stay healthy, to keep their heart healthy, to keep their lungs healthy, to maintain body weight, running for an arthritic patient isn't that exercise because they can run either you know, for 15 minutes until the knee gives out on them or they can spend an hour on an elliptical machine usually that's a better compromise for them. So for patients who have significant arthritis, running is not a good exercise. And that's where it gets a little confusing because everybody will hear, oh, well, my brother-in-law had arthritis and they told him he can't run anymore. So they associate that, oh, that's where the arthritis came from. But it's not true. And if you look at populations of, of people who are going to end up with a surgical knee injury, somebody who plays tennis once a week is gonna be 10 times higher risk of developing arthritis, developing torn cartilages, and ending up in the operating room than somebody that runs 50 miles a week because basically <clears throat> typical sports activities like running, jumping, pivoting, twisting, turning tend to cause more of those problems like torn cartilages that can eventually lead to arthritic change. So uh, keeping moving down the chain, uh, shin splints something that a lot of people end up with either on a minor basis or, or more. Um, the big Latin name term we like for it is medial tibial stress syndrome, which is basically a reflection of <clears throat> inflammation and changes um, where the bone atta where the muscles attached to the bone there. So this is a cross section of the bone where it's on the side here. This is sort of a front view. Basically the bone lights up right here in areas of inflammation. So things that have more water light up on this, uh, this MRI scan. This is a lot of inflammation and, and some pretty bad shin splints. <clears throat> um, the timing of this typically is gonna be mild during a run but gets worse afterwards. That's a big difference from stress fracture which tends to hurt a little bit at mile one by mile two or three starts to hurt, and by mile 26.2 really hurts like hell. I've done one of those, so that's, I can tell you it's not much fun. Um, so a different typical pattern than, than a stress fracture which can occur in that same area. Plantar fasciitis, um, something a lot of people hear, uh, or a lot of people will talk about and feel. It can be very mild, it can be very significant. Basically it's heel pain, it typically becomes better during a run, it's one of those things that kind of stretches out. Um, really bad in the morning, you wake up, first step down, it's like, wow, that really hurts. Um, and it's a common injury that occurs, again, from that sort of repetitive stress across the entire chain of the, uh, of the, uh, um, the lower ankle. Um, there's some continuity between that of Achilles tendonitis and calf tendonitis. The Achilles being <coughs> sort of the prime uh, area of propulsion when we push forward, the Achilles is receiving tons of stress there. Um, you get inflammation of both the Achilles tendon as well as the calf muscle that comes above it. Um, again, a common sight that we see things start to get in trouble. Stretching before and after runs definitely is helpful to, to uh, both prevent and treat that. Um, that is pain in the lower calf. Again, oftentimes does get better during a run, so these are some of the things you can kind of run through um, and, still, uh, and still maintain some training. Um, blisters, uh, one thing we always want to watch out for. Um, all of us are going to see some foot changes as the runs start getting longer and longer during the training. Um, blisters can be either a minor nuisance or they can become a real problem. If they get big enough, they can be pretty painful. Um, the things to uh, remember about it is that the shoes oftentimes are the key, um, and it's a poorly fitting shoe sometimes to do it, and that can be either too large or too small. So if your shoes are too small, sometimes you get pressure on the tips of the toes, which can cause this as well as something else. If they're too big, then that's protective for the toes, but oftentimes creates stress across here. Um, treatment, uh, I'm sorry, so prevention is of course, uh, uh, things like double wall socks, which can be very helpful. Vaseline, very helpful. Um, uh, last year I had some running shoe problems and ended up getting a new pair of running shoes two weeks before the marathon. <clears throat> um, not really the best recommended way to do this stuff, but I swapped my, my feet in Vaseline, had no problems during the race, and my feet looked great afterwards with no major blisters. So even though you like to get the break-in period on the shoes before you start doing long runs, a little Vaseline can go a long way for, uh, for a marathon. Um, uh, double wall socks and then again proper size shoes can make a big difference. Um, I don't think I included this in the slide, but one thing that's important for blisters, not, you like not to pop them, you want to try to let them heal up on their own, at least develop a layer of skin underneath it before you pop them. So if they're big enough, then you can actually drain them with a needle, and obviously a doctor would want to do that, but you can actually suck the fluid out, <coughs> let it kind of compress down, and that's a much better way to treat it than just to pop it and take the top off, because then that skin underneath is still very sort of raw. So if a blister um, comes up, try not to pop it. If it pops, it happens, but it's better to, to try to leave it intact. Um, Subungual hematomas, which are basically the black toenails that, that uh, many of us, myself included, will experience um, during these uh, long runs. They look terrible. They're not pretty. 
but <laughs> they actually tend to be not very painful and they tend to really not cause any major problems. The key is not to go monkeying with them, not to take off toenails or go to a podiatrist that's gonna rip your toenail off. Um, what you wanna do is just let them heal up. They typically aren't super painful and once you finish the marathon, they usually start to resolve on their own. Um, so recovering from an injury, we talked about a little bit. Um, uh, ice and cold packs, very important. Um, local effects, it decreases the pain, it decreases the swelling, it's really good after an exercise. Um, ice baths, a lot of people use them as professional runners. A lot of those guys have like some type of an arrangement where they've got a huge bucket full of very cold water. Um, it's very helpful to do, it's not always so easy to do. Um, I, I myself have never actually filled a bathtub full of ice and water and like actually plunged all the way in it, but I have gotten the water pretty cold in a bath and kept my legs in it enough to get them cooled off. Um, and that definitely can be helpful both in kind of prevention as well as if something's bothering you to, to sort of work on trying to keep it under control. Anti-inflammatories, Aleve, Advil, Celebrex, some of these are prescriptions, some not. Um, more of a systemic treatment, it definitely can be helpful, um, especially in the early stages of developing some of these overuse injuries. The body oftentimes responds with inflammation to an injury. The problem is it oftentimes overshoots the mark and puts too much inflammation in there. Um, so using these medications can oftentimes kind of calm it down and keep it from turning into something that's a little bit more uh, substantial. Obviously, it's not going to fix a stress fracture if one is developing. If you've got rip roaring horrific tendonitis, then maybe it's going to want to a little bit, but it's not going to really fix the problem as much as it might help a little bit. Um, there's also topical versions that we typically use. These are prescription versions. Um, collector patches um, can be very helpful. Or Terran gel is another one that's nice. Um, it's just a little, it's a localized way to do it. And for patients who have got, have one area that's really pretty tender, that's very sore to the touch, that's localized, I find this stuff um, tends to work oftentimes as well, if not better than, uh, than using a systemic agent you take by mouth. Um, physical therapy, I'm gonna leave this uh, to our next speaker to talk more about, but, but basically uh, analyzing gait, stretching massage, strengthening ultrasound, even laser techniques can be very helpful for this stuff. Um, the one important thing that I tell people is, is that the key um, element of physical therapy that is very important is that your therapist should not just be focusing on the one area that hurts. So if you've got kneecap problems, they shouldn't be just looking at your kneecap. They should be looking at the entire chain, top to bottom, from, from core strength, the hips <laughs> down below. And a good physical therapist that knows runners is going to do that. The first thing they're gonna do is check out your flexibility all over the place and see where that lies. Because a lot of times the problem may be in one area, but that's just a weak link in the chain. The IT band may be where it hurts, but it may be a reflection of a, a host of other problems with the entire leg that are really the issue. And that's what separates a good physical therapist from somebody that just throws on a bag of ice, puts some stem on you and says, okay, come back tomorrow. So this important thing to re realize if you're doing any therapy. Um, cortisone shots, something we use, you know, not that uncommonly. Basically, it's a very localized area <laughs> of very potent anti-inflammatory. So for someone who has IT band syndrome, who's doing physical therapy, who's addressing all of the entire limb problems, but has an area of the IT band that's super inflamed and is not responding well or needs to get better faster for a race, it can be an effective treatment. It's used for certain things and it's not used for others. We don't use it for kneecap tendonitis, we don't use it for Achilles tendonitis because the stress across those areas can lead to rupture, which is something we want to avoid. But for IT band syndrome, even patellofemoral pain, for hip tendonitis, um, for other tendonitis around the area, a lot of times the cortisone shots can be pretty helpful, especially in the course of marathon training when something kind of needs to get done modestly aggressively, certainly not surgically. Um, PRP you may hear about, I put it in here just because people do throw it around. It's a kind of new technique. We, it got a lot of sort of excitement a couple of years ago when it first came out and it was available in the office for us to use. We basically take platelets out of the arm and, uh, and, and forms of blood. We spin them down and take just the platelets out of there. Platelets are very rich in growth factors, which are different than the rest of the blood cells. Um, it does have some techni some success in treating localized tendonitis, and I do think it's a sort of useful technique. The insurances don't cover it, which makes it kind of expensive and not so good. And we still kind of only use it for technique for uh, patients or problems that really sort of seem not to be responding to other things. Um, but it is an option out there, and some people will, uh, will use it from here and there. So I put it out there just so people can, can know about it. So finally, um, in conclusion, basically running is supposed to be somewhat painful. <laughs> <laughs> smiling with a big grin on your face every minute you're running and probably something you're either not pushing yourself very hard or something you a little long. Um, it's not easy to tell when to stop training. It's all about knowing where that threshold is and knowing where you are. Um, and some of that is knowing your body, trying to figure out what is, uh, you know, what is, is, is real and what is not in terms of pain. 
Um, it's always difficult to tell what a normal ache is. Aches are part of running. Um, in general, most aches are kind of poorly localized. You don't really have a localized area that's tender to touch. It's sort of sore, but not super painful in one spot. Um, and discomfort that improves during a run usually is not something that's so bad. So if something seems like it's kind of sore at the beginning, but by about mile two, you're thinking to yourself, gee, I'm not really noticing it so much. Um, that tends to be pretty helpful. And at mile 20 on a marathon, pretty much everything hurts anyway. So at that stage, <laughs> most things are, well, if, you, if they've made it to mile 20, usually you're okay. Um, and tightness after a run, again, is pretty normal. It's very normal to have tight hamstrings. One of the other principles I tell physical therapists all the time when I lecture to them is that, physical, is that runners are not dancers. Um, most of us have very tight hamstrings in the course of training. We end up with tight calf muscles, tight Achilles. Part of that is, is you know, it should be addressed by stretching, but at the same time, we're not trying to make these runners into dancers by being able to bring their hip up like a rocket. Um, so it's important to realize that it's good to do some stretching, but you're never going to achieve the same kind of flexibility that somebody who's doing a sport like yoga or something that requires a lot more flexibility in the course of doing it does. Um, so in general, injuries are pain that's in a very small area that's very tender to touch. That's something that's a sign of maybe in a localized area that could turn into something bad. Symptoms that tend to get worse with distance. So at mile two, it feels okay, but at mile four, well, it's kind of sore. And at mile six or seven, you're thinking to yourself, gee, I wonder if I have a, uh, any way to get home from here. Um, <laughs> and pain that affects walking after runs. So if you stop running and then start walking, and you think, wow, I'm really kind of limping. Something's not right. That really is getting more into that zone of injury. And it can be a fine line sometimes. Um, in conclusion, basically, overtraining, number one cause of injury is the key is figuring out where that threshold is. And believe me, it's hard to tell. I've been doing this a long time, and I think I'm pretty good at it. But I've developed stress fractures along the way. If you push yourself hard enough, then you will get some injuries here and there. Um, and the important thing is that with the exception of the hip fracture, almost everything, when it heals, it heals with equal strength as it did before. Um, running is dependent on, recovery is dependent on the gradual return of running. So you want to go slow and sort of take your time to get back on board again. And last but not least, take hip pain seriously. I'm extremely, extremely aggressive on MRI runners that come in with hip problems. Unless I'm really convinced that it's a very localized tendonitis, I send everybody off to an MRI scan pretty stat if it really ends up being like a you know, significant pain that could get to bring somebody into my office. Um, because the consequence of missing a hip stress fracture and letting a runner continue on a training program can be catastrophic. And I've seen some pretty innocuous um, uh, injuries that really turned into be pretty whopping stress fractures that would have gotten a lot worse. I had a one lady that was running a tough mutter race and she was having some mild hip pain. It just wasn't getting any better. And I said, you gotta go get an MRI. And she said, I don't want to. I'm just doing some home, home treatments. And finally, a week before the race, she said, you know what, I'm a little bit sore. It's really like still aching. And I sent her for an MRI and she had a 50% femoral neck stress fracture that probably had a 90% chance of completing if she had jumped off of one of those first uh, um, obstacle courses. So obstacles in the course. So. Um, certainly, I think hip pain, you know, not every little ache that you have, but sustained aches, ones that stick around for a long time, those typically bear at least uh, investigating with an MRI to make sure there's nothing bad. So if one of your friends seems to be limping and they say, you know, this hurts right here, tell them they should get seen by somebody to get a scan. That's all I got. <laughs> Good job. <laughs>